Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode of Speak of the Devils. My name is Dom Fusco, alongside Sammy St. Jean and Sam Glavin, and we are stoked to have you back for another jam-packed episode of Speak of the Devils. And really excited for this one, guys. We had a great interview with Coach Ceretti last week. We have an interview with Jimmy Martelli today and just a whole lot of other good stuff going on. So we are grateful to have you back. Yeah, absolutely. We're pumped to, you know, do our normal intro segment talking about sports. I mean, we could start anywhere because every sport's still kind of going right now. I mean, we kind of neglected the U.S. Open last week, so I guess we could throw a little bit of love that way. And just how tough, um, I did want to mention just how tough, uh, I believe, Wingfoot was for everyone who played. I mean, uh, Bryson uh, DeChambeau was the only uh, participant under par at the end of that. So, I mean, the fact that he was able to win at six under in the second place play. Uh, Matthew Wolf, he was at even. So, I mean, it just yeah. shows the difficulty of that course. And I wanted to throw a little love at uh, golf in the U.S. Open since we missed it last week. Yeah, another sport that we really haven't been talking about is uh, is baseball, the MLB. So we'll go, we'll get into that uh, as well. I'm going to give you my uh, uh, top five of I – I don't want to spoil it yet, but it's got, got to do with the MLB. So we'll get into that after the interview with uh, Mr. Martelli. All right. Yeah. So with all that being said, we're excited to get into the episode and here we go. Let's do it. Yeah. You guys want to jump in? I mean, we can jump into football first. Um, yeah. That's kind of where we usually go to anyways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the one thing that I did want to bring up to you guys is the injuries that happened this past weekend. I mean, what are your thoughts on the number of huge injuries that happened to, I mean, torn ACLs with Saquon, um, I believe Bosa, Yep. And, um, it was kind of just a shock. I mean, there was a bunch of major injuries, yeah. even a couple minor injuries to like Devontae Adams and stuff. So what are you guys' take on that? It's honestly, it's, be I really do think it's because we didn't have preseason games. I mean, there had, and during practices and stuff, it's because like they, they weren't allowed to hit, they weren't allowed to go hundred percent, you know, and we, we criticized Joe judge for having, having him take the, the red shirts off the quarterbacks, but you know, maybe that was what everybody needed to do and in order to avoid all these injuries. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's hurt my Eagles. It's hurt everybody. It hurt my fantasy team. Like, I have Saquon Barkley on my fantasy team, and he's, he, he's done. So, it kind of sucks. I know a lot of people took Christian McCaffrey with the number one overall pick, and he's out for, like, I don't know, eight weeks. So, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely tough. And I think, the le like, the level of football play hasn't really been as great um, across the league, and not, not just because I'm an Eagles fan, but – just uh, just across the league. So it, we've seen that these preseason games are actually pretty important as much as everybody hates them. So, Yeah, I mean, I predicted the 49ers to go pretty far uh, in the beginning of the season. They just lost Nick Bosa. They just lost Jimmy Garoppolo. Yep. Debo Samuel's already out. Uh, who else? They lost a couple other guys. Richard Sherman didn't play. Yep. Uh, you know, they're just a mess. So – you know, all around the league, everybody's kind of suffering it. And, um, you know, in terms of the Eagles, they already suck, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, wow, so we're just wow. trying to just try to get through the season at this point. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, I mean, I feel like, like Sam was saying, like the preseason really is important. And I'm wondering whether they'll revisit their plan to bring it down to three games now after seeing, like, the effect of, you know, cutting a preseason entirely out. Because I know they were planning on cutting it down to three games versus the four we have every year. So it'll be interesting to see if they revisit that this uh, this coming off season, or even just during the season, um, especially if next week is anything like what we just previously had. I know, like well, everybody everybody hates preseason, and they want they want to bring the bring them back. But now that we've actually seen what happened, I mean, I want to say like six star players from from different teams just went down for a good amount of time, like McCaffrey, Saquon, um, like our our rookie wide receiver Jalen Rager for the Eagles just went down. Uh, it's it's all over, and they, they have to look at it and say, all right, well, maybe maybe we need to keep these preseason games around. And they, I think, they definitely have to revisit it at least. They have to they have to look at it. They got to change something because this is just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know. We all kind of expected it. There was going to be injuries. Um, guys aren't conditioned enough. Guys, their bodies aren't in shape. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, seen that in hockey, you've seen that in basketball. Uh, you know, all, countless other sports that are going wrong right now. Uh, so when you have a sport like football uh, where injuries are already prevalent, like, you know, what do you expect? Yeah, no. 
Definitely. And before we move on from football, yeah, we give a little shout out to the Raiders, the surprise team of the season so far. Uh, and their upset win of the Saints. I mean, I don't think anyone really saw that one coming. So, and the debut of their new stadium in Las Vegas. So, definitely um, at least paying attention to the Raiders now. I, I'll say this I hate saying that teams are breakout teams or teams are like looking terrible after two weeks. I yeah. mean, like it, it's, I have. I'm, I'm, I have nothing against the Raiders in any way. Um, in fact, I love Mike Mayock. He's a, he's a Philly guy. Um, but I just, I, I have a hard time getting on board with a, with a, like a hype team after two weeks. And it's the same, the same goes with, with the Eagles. Like I have a, obviously they suck right now, but I have a hard time thinking that the, the season is done because there's a lot of football left to be played. So yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else to add to that. Um, yeah. You know, we can uh, – we'll touch on – another thing we kind of neglected last week was the Stanley Cup. Um, two games have been played, and I know you guys being Philly guys probably didn't want to talk too much about the Stanley Cup. And I was there too. I'm a Bruins fan, so didn't really want to mention hockey too much. But, I mean, you got uh, Tampa and Dallas playing for the Stanley Cup. Series at 1-1. Um, so it'll be interesting to see that one play out. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that one going, going seven, especially with how both teams have played throughout the, uh, throughout the playoffs. Yeah. Dallas has definitely proven to be like a, that sleeper team. I mean, uh, Tampa Bay, obviously everybody knew that they were, they were pretty good going in, going into it. And I don't see how Tampa Bay loses this just because they're so well-rounded like um, offensively and defensively and a great goaltender and stuff. So I don't see, I don't see how Tampa Bay loses this one. Yeah. I mean, I, Tampa Bay, though, they've found ways to lose in the past, and it's possible they could find ways to lose again. Uh, Dallas has been really hot, and they're not – they might not be on paper as good of a team as Tampa Bay, but, you know, they're playing really hard. They're playing good hockey. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's going to go to seven. And, honestly, it's just going to be whoever shows up more to that seventh game. It seems to be something like a 2-1 game, they'll win it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I imagine we'll touch on whether the series ends or not. We'll touch on it more next week, kind of knowing a little bit more about how the series is going to play out. It's tough to really see what the series is going to do, especially when it's tied 1-1. Um, but, I mean, we can check in a little bit on the conference finals quickly before we move on to our interview. Um, we saw the Celtics take game three, and we saw also the Nuggets take game three last night. Um, the Celtics are going to play game four tonight. Do you guys have any thoughts on those games? Jamal Murray, man. He's freaking killing it. He was on the list last week. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. Jamal Murray. Yeah, I'm rooting for, like I said last week, I'm rooting for a Nuggets Heats final. Exactly. Uh, Jimmy Butler versus Jamal Murray. I would love to see it. So that's what I'm rooting for. LeBron gets on my nerves. Um, I hate the Celtics. Yep. So there we go. Pretty easy for me. <laughs> it's two teams I can root for there. Yeah, I mean, last week, um, my prediction, I predicted that the Heat and the Lakers would play each other in the uh, finals. But as a Celtics fan, I'm obviously hoping I'm wrong. Uh, but the one stat I did want to point out that I saw when scrolling through Twitter is that Boston has led through three games almost 75% of the time, yet they are down 2-1. So it was kind of a very interesting. Um, That's crazy, thing. man. That's nuts. <laughs> I That's kind of why I picked against them because they find they find ways to lose close games and it happened the same way against the Raptors and it was really uh, it's concerning especially when the games all have been so close. The Celtics right. have had double digit leads if not beyond ten points, 15, 20 point leads in every single game so far, and in almost all of them they found a way to lose. So it's definitely concerning as a fan. I love the Heat, man. They look they look fantastic. I love Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson. You know, Duncan Robinson, obviously the story coming up from a Division three team going to Michigan and then getting drafted, now playing significant minutes in conference finals. The Eastern Conference Finals is crazy. I love that story. Um, and obviously Jamal Murray coming up from like a six-man or like a just a regular starter or something like that to being one of the stars of the bubble is awesome. I just – I love sports and, and when it comes to that stuff. So I'm, I'm rooting for it, for a heat and nuggets finals. Absolutely. Well, with that, let's get into our interview with coach Jimmy Martelli. All right. And we are back, but that does not mean we don't have time for a quick read from the grazery healthy, not boring. That's not just the motto of the grazery, but it is also their promise to you visit the grazery today and indulge on fresh Mediterranean inspired salads, sandwiches, and soups among other great options on a menu that serves both breakfast and lunch. 
eat in or take out. No reservation needed here, so hurry on down to 156 West High Street, just yards from the campus, and enjoy a fresh and healthy meal today. Go ahead, Don. Martelli. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, today, we have very special guest, Dickinson alumni and current coach on the BCU staff is Jimmy Martelli. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you guys having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. So, just... Just to get it started here, I know you have a deep passion for wearing the red. And, you know, I feel that when I put on the red every time as well down on Biddle Field. What did, when you still hear, as an alumni, when you hear wearing the red from an alumni, from a player, from anybody involved in Dickinson Athletics, what does that mean to you? Man, great question. Uh, first, first, I'm not allowed to wear red because our rival across town is red. So that's that's the only reason I'm not. Uh, so I apologize for that one, but um, that's the that's the one color around here that I'll get fired for. So um, that that's been cut out of my wardrobe a little bit. Um, but but honestly, what it means to me when it boils down to it is people, you know. And uh, my coach, Coach Senses, to to Coach Soretti, uh, to guys I played with, to the alumni uh, that we still stay in touch through email chains and all those kind of things. It, it really boils boils down to that. You know, every school has colors. Every school can can try to steal that, you know, wearing the blue, wearing the orange, wearing the whatever or sinus is brown is. But wearing the red is it's different because of all the people that go into that. You know, and from the athletic trainers like Julie Emrine that was there for, for me to to Joel Quachon who was there at that time and obviously is can, taking on a different role, uh, all of those people uh, impacted my life beyond Dickinson and they made wearing the red so special. And, and I know there's a lot of people probably on campus now that, that do the same for, for all the student athletes there too. You know, hundred percent. And the thing is too, is I want to kind of go a little bit further back. I know last week you were talking about Justin, how you grew up in uh, or near Philly. So I wanted to ask you kind of growing up, I know you originally went to Scranton and then went on to Dickinson in a transfer. When did you kind of know you wanted to go to school around Pennsylvania? Because I know a lot of our students at Dickinson and in our fellow Centennial Conference schools are coming from the New Jersey area. So just in terms of possibly relatability, when did you kind of figure that out that that was where you wanted to go is somewhere in this, this general area? Yeah, uh, coming out of high school, I honestly, I, I don't know if I would have known what Dickinson was, you know, in, in league, I did look at Johns Hopkins and, and a little bit of their sinus. Um, but when I went up to Scranton, it was the right fit at the right time for me. It ended up, you know, that ended up changing. And then my cousin um, was on staff at Shippensburg at, at the time when I was looking to transfer. And he said, listen, there's a school right down the street. It's really good academics, blah, 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 whatever he sold me on. And I don't know why he was involved, but he and I are very close. So I drove down one weekend to visit him, um, down 81, went to, went to visit him, hung out, and then drove over to meet with Coach Senses, who was new at the time. It, it was in his first semester. And uh, I, honestly, it's one of those things I'll never forget. It was pouring rain. It was, you know, cold. It was December, I think, or, or, or late November. And... Um, I just, it was, it was one of those things that you tell people that, you know, oh, you'll know when you know, or you'll know when you're on the campus, you'll get that feel. And it literally just happened that, that quick. I know at the end of that visit, sitting in coach's office, he's like, there's no way you're coming. Like it, it was just a bad visit. You know, it was just uh, a tough, tough day, you know, weather-wise and some other, uh, other little hiccups. And, and I said, no, nah, coach, the opposite. Like, this is where I want to be. I just know I do. Um, and that was it. I, I stopped looking at other, other schools and, um, it was it was absolutely the right decision you know the University of Scranton has great tradition basketball wise and, and you know we weren't quite there yet uh, but I, I don't regret I don't get one second uh, that's a classic uh, rainy day and car drizzle for sure um, I definitely want to I want to ask you a little bit about just your your career through uh, through Dickinson basketball uh, what were some high points and what were some low points uh Great question. You know, I, I honestly, I, I don't want to sound cliche, but there weren't really low points. I mean, again, we didn't on on the on the record side of things, we didn't do what I would have hoped. You know, but the, but the high points really stick out more. And you know, so a win at Johns Hopkins my senior year was just a phenomenal win. Um, you know, and in the same year we beat F and M at F and M, 
always always a good time to beat them. Yeah. You know, they have a dip zone in the in the end zone, and as a as a younger, uh, maybe more emotional guy, I, I you know I might have talked to them, just said hello to the students that were there at that time um after we won that game and so you remember those things and those are the things that I carry with me you know to this day and, and we had a zoom not too long ago with a bunch of guys from that era and those are the things that we talked about you know remember that bus ride uh you know and back then honestly it, it, I sound older but it, it you know it was like iPad or iPods were just just out you know a cell phone was like not even really you know it might have been in my bag it was you didn't even turn them on so the, the opportunity for enjoyment on the buses post game and pre game and all those kind of things are really the high moments. And then living with those guys and, and then, you know, taking that on to being at different weddings and, and seeing guys have kids and all those kind of things and meeting up with them now is, you know, we, we reminisce about those good wins and, and fun times as a, as opposed to what our record was, you know, uh, at the end of the year. Now I know you, Growing up around basketball, it's kind of been a part of your life, part of your family's, you know, just the culture. Uh, what are some of the main things you took away from being a student athlete to now working in basketball operations, going back to working with student athletes? You know, what have you taken from there from becoming a student athlete to now becoming the coach? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, the, the, the student athlete, Today, it's, it's just a lot different and it, it changes daily, not just with the social un, uh, unrest and things of that nature. And down here in Richmond, that's huge right now, obviously with Confederate monuments and all sorts of stuff. But um, like I said, I mean, we, we, we didn't have Twitter and Instagram and whatever. So there, there wasn't a concern of followers and likes back then. It was just about the guys on your team and, and trying to do well, you know, for yourself and your family. So trying to just take my experience and, and honestly our, our head coach played at Lebanon Valley. We have an assistant that played at Lebanon Valley. We have another assistant played at Randolph Macon. So the division three mentality is something that I would say probably permeates in this, in our team's culture. Now, you know, um, we do have another guy that played at Rice and played in the NBA for a year and those kind of things. But um, that idea of playing for the love of the game, you know, and I look at the student athletes at division three right now where seasons are canceled and, interrupted or un uncertainty and you know they're they're still holding out hope and those kind of things not unlike our guys but at this level it's a little bit more of a business and I try to make sure that they're reminded every single day like listen we did all the same stuff you guys do all the same stuff that we do uh you know from two to three hours of practice ice bath treatment you know getting up early lifting eating right doing all those things in addition to your academics so um, you know, it's just a little bit different in terms of the business side at Division One. But again, like I said, just just making sure that they realize why they're playing. And I know Coach Soretti in the last episode talked about, you know, their why and, and why certain guys do it. It shouldn't change no matter where you are or what you're doing. And so for me as a, as administrator, coach operations now, you know, it's um, trying to make sure that they, they understand their why and, and try to get them to, to attain that goal. It's to help my mom. It's to help my brothers. It's to be the first one to graduate. My goal and, and, and my drive every single day is to help them get a little bit closer to that. Absolutely. And right there, yeah, I just heard you again mention the family. And that was something you and Justin talked quite a bit about. And I want to know, how does that kind of family mentality, which probably comes a little bit from the whole D3 mentality, because I don't see them too, too differently. But how does that uh, family mentality you know, impact you as a coach? How does that influence you when you take your day-to-day -day approach to coaching and being a leader to a team? My family now or, or like just in general? Well, just in general, yeah. Yeah, obviously, you know, my, my dad doing what he did and, and I grew up, um, you know, through the game of basketball, I would say. You know, I, I was taken and exposed to so many different things because of the game of basketball that, you know, now I feel – the opportunity to give back and, and help others see the same um, joy, I guess, and, and realize that one, one ball can bring you together across the world. So uh, try to, try to help with that. And then now with my own children, uh, it's funny last night, I picked them up from field hockey practice. I got home. I'm, you know, 
My wife's still at the field. I'm supposed to get them in, get them a bath, put them right to bed. Well, that was at seven. At eight o'clock, my wife rolled home and we're outside in the front yard and they're playing basketball. Well, they got out of the car and ran over to play basketball with whoever in the, in the street. I wasn't going to say no. I mean, it was like the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I got in a little bit of, I got a little bit of heat for that one that, that they weren't in bed. But, um, you know, I think that the, the, the great thing about our, uh, our team and our, our university right now is we're really family oriented. So it, it gives it, uh, you know, it's not division one, division two, II, division three, there's nothing bad about any of them. You know, um, division three, I feel like is more family oriented. It, it is more that you're there for one another. I, I heard in one of the podcasts, you guys talking about how much support there is between sports, you know, and you go to a baseball game and you sit in the stands and there's three, four different sports, uh, field hockey game. There's three, four different people from different sports and they're all supporting one another. And, you know, that gets a little bit more difficult here because of time commitments, but, you know, we try to do the same things here. And, and along with, you know, my family is around, I have three daughters and, you know, one of them's coming to practice with me on Saturday because she has nowhere else to go. So she's got to come with me and she, she'll be here and she knows the guys and FaceTimes the guys every once in a while. So it's, uh, it's really a blessing and it, it allows them to, to kind of learn uh, life lessons through, through sport. Coach, tell us a little bit about uh, a day in the life and, and your job as director of basketball operations. Uh, uh, a day in the life, if I told you today, it would be much different than tomorrow. You know, it's just the way it is. You try to plan things as best you can, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about flexibility and, and not just in COVID times. Honestly, it's, you know, there's things that come up and almost everything in the program hits my desk first. And then I try to disseminate everything that's going on. So, you know, as director of operations here, I'm in charge of scheduling. So game scheduling, which is a little crazy right now um, to our guys, personal schedules and, and myself and our academic advisor really handle all of the individual guys schedules on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you, as you guys know, as, as college kids, not just student athletes, but as college kids, things come up, you know, and, and so just trying to help them stay on top of that. Um, you know, from the budget and travel to gear, uh, all those things kind of fall th and come through my office, which is awesome. You know, and, and yeah. I worked in the corporate world for three years. And one of the things that I didn't love about it, I'll say is, is the more nine to five pace to it. You know, people come in and come out and it's just, they're there to do a job. And, you know, th there's plenty of nights when you're in college athletics where you don't know what time I planned on getting home at five to have dinner, but, you know, now all of a sudden it's eight o'clock and, you know, a guy came in your office and they need your help and, and you're, you got to be there for them. And, and that, so, uh, but that's what I love about it. I love kind of the, the unknown, if you will. Um, but it's, I, I have a, a great job because I have daily interactions with so many people, you know, from, from our academic side to our facility side to ticketing to donors, you know, to our players and coaching staff on a daily basis. Uh, and that, that just makes it enjoyable for me. I love that, especially, yeah. you know, with us looking at a, you know, an uncertain job market in the next couple of years, you know, but someone like you who just loves their job and they love, you love it because you feel purpose and you have a passion for helping these kids out. That's awesome to hear. Uh, it's so not we, a bad thing. I get to wear sweats to work too. I, I just throw that <laughs> out. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. you can exactly. find that. If you can find that, I'll suggest that. All right, I'm, no, I'm, I'm writing that down for sure. I'm, that's noted. Um, so November 25th, we saw, is now the target start date for D1 Hoops. Uh, what's your guys' mindset going into these next couple of months, and uh, how have you been able to adapt over the past, you know, couple of months? Yeah, uh, the scheduling piece first. I mean, honestly, we're, we're in the Charleston Classic, which is an ESPN event, Um I don't, I'm sure all the thousands and millions of listeners that I'm not breaking news, I hope to, to all those people, but uh, you know, we've been told we're going to Orlando, but I haven't seen anything official. I mean, I know there was an article the other day about that. So still waiting on that. Um, and then we have a game at LSU that we're, we're trying to figure out and it's tied to TV. So there's just a lot of moving pieces. And right now we're just waiting for some of these power five conferences in the big East and American to, to make some decisions on what their conference schedules look like. So, um, 
you know, again, the VCU brand and, and some of the things that we bring to the table, a lot of people want, want us to play and, and, you know, the TV aspect of it when, when our arena is full, which it won't be due to COVID, but, you know, those are things that play on TV well. So trying to just, like I said, be flexible, be ready. You know, I, I've talked to UVA, I talked to Virginia Tech, I talked to Georgetown, Maryland, probably just in the last 24 hours, just about options nothing set in stone, but again, just trying to make sure that we're ready um, and, and people know we're available in case, you know, big opportunities arise. And so we're just, just kind of hour by hour waiting and as certain news breaks, other pieces of the puzzle fall into, uh, into place. So um, that's, that's what we've been doing over the last couple of months. Our guys actually have been here. A majority of our 14 players have been here since June 8th. Um, they live right next to our practice facility and it's just a great setup. So they've been here. They did go home for a little while in August, um, but we've been, we've been really lucky to um, stay safe and, and still be able to work. And our guys have been able to get in the gym and lift and, and work out and all those kind of things. And we started workouts right when they got back in August and uh, we'll go, you know, three more times this week. So it's, uh, it's been great. Our guys have been very resilient, not knowing what's going on. They set that date. It was great. Had to, you know, put a target on the calendar. You know, there's so many variables that could still move. It could still change. And so just trying to get better every single day. And if we do that, we'll be ready for whoever we play, whenever we play them. Now, I know every team, you know, it should this work out and everyone be able to play come no, uh, late November. I know every team, every coach, every program has their own way to define success, to have a goal going into the season. What is that for you and for VCU? Yeah, that's that's uh, a great point. You know, and I think changes year to year. Obviously, we have high expectations here at VCU. You know, we've been in the NCAA tournament um, quite a bit, and there's a Final Four banner that hangs in our gym that's, you know, looms large. It's a big shadow that, that's in, over there, but it's something that's possible here with the support that we have and the facilities we have and the people we have here as well. Um, you know, it's um, um, it's it's a team by team and player by player. You know, so as a as a coach, and, and again, I'm not not the head coach, so his answer might may vary from mine. But you know, do we see growth? You know, I think it's a it's it's all growth. You know, so we have a young team this year. Um, we have I think seven new pieces, and and really we have two seniors and two juniors. Uh, so if we can continue to grow and get better every single day, by the end of the year, we'll be much better. What our record will be and all those kind of things, it's, it's hard to determine. Um, but it may set us up for long-term success as well. You know, this season in, in some fans' eyes and the message board and the Twitter commenters and all that stuff, they may think at the end of the year, oh, maybe we didn't do as well. But internally, we may feel like we've grown so much that we're prepared to be good for the long term. And that's something that we're trying to build here and make sure it's sustainable, you know, for the long term. Just as I know Coach Soretti is, and I'm sure the other coaches are there, um, you know, doing the same thing. So I know that you didn't necessarily want to get into coaching when you first when you first got out of college. Uh, so you, then you said earlier that you had this nine to five office job before and you said that you hated it and then decided to get into coaching. So obviously your father being Phil Martelli, um, what did you go to him for any kind of advice? And if so, what was that advice? Yeah, honestly, his advice from, from the day I graduated to till now is just do something that makes you happy that you're passionate about, you know, whatever that is. Um, and again, I loved my nine to five job because I was home and I was able to do things on the weekends. Uh, so there were positives to it. It just, it just, it didn't fuel the fire inside, you know? And, and so, um, at some point I, I just felt like I needed to make a change, even though I had gone to coaching and then come back. So, you know, again, outside of when I graduated from Dickinson in 05, you know, coach census was the one that really kind of put the bug in my ear. And I said, oh, I'll do it for a year, you know, and, and then got the opportunity with coach Rhodes down at Randolph Macon and, you know, drove down and saw the, the high level basketball that they had and the opportunity they had, I just couldn't pass it up. And then it just kind of snowballed and, um, you know, so he, you know, and then once I got into it and then got back into it, you know, my dad's 
just just supportive and and I know a lot of people find it uh maybe different or whatever but you know he's he's my dad you know at the end of the day yeah I, I've walked with him down in Avalon New Jersey and people stare at him and I'm like what are you staring at like I know the two of us looked alike so maybe they think like man look at those guys like I, you know especially with my haircut but you know I, it, it's it's honestly like he he's just my dad just just as you know, anybody else's dad is, is their biggest fan or supporter and wants them to do well and wants them to be happy and, and successful. He, he could care less if I was coaching JV, CYO, sixth graders, or, you know, um, playing the national championship. As long as he knows I'm happy and um, my family and his, his grandkids and all that stuff are, are enjoying life and, and doing well, honestly, he – he could care less. He he never steered me to it and didn't steer me away from it. You know, um, he just said, evaluate the, you know, the options and the decisions that you make and, and go from there. Actually, I actually, I actually grew up uh, a St. Joe's fan. So, uh, you know, always love seeing your, uh, seeing your dad here in a month, WIP in the mornings. Um, but, uh, you know, now I'll have to have to become a VCU fan too. Now that, uh, now that I've been able to talk to you. My, uh, my, my next question for you, my next question for you is not totally basketball related. Uh, it's kind of looking back in your days as just like a student, uh, what was your favorite spot on campus? And, you know, like when you think of Dickinson, uh, like you, like you ever put yourself back there and be like, man, like those were good days when I was just like at that spot. Uh, I'm going to send this to my mom. So the library was an unbelievable spot, <laughs> just, you know, uh, the tables in the front was just, <laughs> I spent so many hours there, man. I can't, all right. Um, man, good question. You know, good question. I, I, I think probably, you know, just, just the, the cafeteria and, and hanging out, you know what I mean? It's just like, I was friends with a lot of football players and, and, and you could be in there for hours with those dudes with, with the buffet lines, you know, so Kevin Williams and, and Ziggs and Joe O'Hara, and just guys like that, that, you know, we, you know, and practice four to six, you go over there and it's open to whatever. And you just, you just end up sitting there and, you know, some of those guys the whole time, other guys are just chilling, you know, um, it, it was just a, a great spot, you know, and, and uh, are there, are there, you know, great spots, on, you know, on the lawn and in the chairs and all those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I spent a, a ton of time obviously in the climb and, and trying to get in the side doors and all those kind of things too. But uh, yeah, honestly, it's just the, the times I, I honestly would go back to the, to those and just, you know, you sit there, you eat, and then all of a sudden the plate's just sitting in front of you and hours pass because you're arguing about the Phillies and the Eagles and the whoever, you know, all the different different teams or different things going on or some nonsense that you saw on TV or, what, you know, whatever. I mean, those are just – those were relationship building. And, and honestly, like I said in the beginning, we were all wearing the red, but, but that's what made it so special is – guys and obviously sitting with my teammates and Brad Litchfield and Travis Dahl and Matt Keys and, and uh, Nick Leonardelli and uh, all sort of Pat Coyle and, and Sarsfield. I mean, like, you know, just, just hanging with one another and, and sometimes not even talking about anything, just, just kind of spending that time together. It's just a special time that you don't really get anywhere else. Good to know some things never change. Yeah, like Cap said, it still holds true today. <laughs> so is, is it still, you know, like the grilled cheese on Wednesdays and all that stuff, or it's probably yeah. probably a little healthier now, I guess. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. yeah a little bit. <laughs> um, I guess we'll stay with staying connected to Dickinson in terms of your relationship there. And I kind of want to just ask, since we talked to Coach Soretti last time, and obviously you're busy during the basketball season, but someone who obviously believes red, how do you still stay connected or um, stay in touch with Dickinson or the team, especially during the season while you're so busy during, you know, your own season? Yeah, honestly, like I'll have their schedule printed out. You know, my dad's an assistant at Michigan. My brother's an assistant at Bryant um, up at Rhode Island. And, and I have other friends at different places and, um, you know, I don't love to say, but one of my best friends is the head coach at Johns Hopkins. So when we get on the bus or, or, or whatever, wherever we're doing, or I get back over to the facility after a game, 
I, and I know they play that night. I'm checking. I'm on centennial.org, give them a plug. But uh, I'm checking the scores right away. And big win, tough loss, whatever. I'm, I'm you know, always trying to text with Coach Soretti and, and those guys and um, just check in with them. You know, I had the opportunity last year. They came down to the Randolph-Macon Christmas tournament and had the opportunity to see them play live, which was which was neat. It was a, a tough loss against Lev Val, so I had to hear about it in the office for a while. Um, I think two years ago, two or three years ago, they came down and beat Christopher Newport. So I had the opportunity to, to kind of host them here for practice in our facility, which was great. Um, so constantly just trying to find ways to stay connected with, with the current team because it is, it is hard. You know, um, but with a phone and, and with some internet service, I, I can check the scores quick and shoot off a text to coach already, you know, great win. Always love beating Gettysburg or whoever, fill in the blanks and um, try to figure out, who, you know, who the guys are in the program and talk to him uh, probably, you know, a couple times a month, just, just checking in and had developed a, a good relationship with him. And um, along with all the other sports, you know, I, I check. I, I'm a, that's one of the websites that I have, you know, bookmarked at the top, like Dickinson Athletics. I go there. I want to know what's going on. I want to know, you know, who's doing well. I don't know the names. I don't know the jersey numbers as well as I, I did when I was there, but it still matters. You know, they, they come down and I know football, I don't know if they were supposed to play Randolph Macon this year, or, you know, in recent years they've played Macon and I'm checking because I want to, I want to talk some trash to some of the guys that I know that are alums. One of, one of my great friends, Mike McGarvey played at Ursinus. So anytime Dickinson or Ursinus play anything, they could be playing ping pong and, and the two of us are texting, you know, Hey, next time I see you, I got you, I got your cheese steak. I got this or that, or, you know, letting them know what's going on. Hey, we're, we're playing well. We play y'all next week. Get ready. Those kind of things. It's, it's, it's fun. It makes it enjoyable. And like I said, that's, that's the easiest way to stay connected. And there's some other people in the, in the athletic department that I like to try to reach out to on email and, and things of that nature every once in a while as well. That's great. I have no other questions for you, but if you guys uh, have anything else, I just wanted to say you've been a fantastic interview. I, I thank you so much for coming back on. Not a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, Sam, you have anything else? I just had one more question. I mean, we usually finish with like a favorite moment or a piece of advice. Yeah. So I figure we'll kind of finish with that. And since you transferred as a junior and a majority of the Dickinson's leadership group coming up this year is going to be juniors. I kind of want to just hear what you have to say in terms of advice or recommendations towards them as being, you know, still on the younger side of leadership since I believe there's only two seniors on the current roster. Yeah. I, and I heard you uh, talk to coach already a little bit about that last time. Um, and Nick Leonardelli, who's a, an assistant at UMass Lowell, and myself got the opportunity, uh, and it was great, early in this in this COVID period in the summer to kind of jump on a Zoom and talk to those guys. And we both discussed different players and teams that maybe overachieved or, or achieved, you know, success in, in that, whatever you term, uh, however you define that term, um, with that team. I think one of the interesting things is you're talking about classes you know, you're talking about, oh, they only have two juniors or two seniors. The team I was on, my junior year, there was no seniors, and I was the only junior by the time the season started. So my senior year, I was the only senior. And then our junior class was, I think, three or four guys at that point. Now it was a turnover, and Coach, um, you know, Census had just got in there. So there was a lot of turnover, a lot of young guys. Um, but I think leadership is – you know, it's twofold. Obviously, there's leaders that talk, and then there's leaders that do. You can do, you can be both. Um, there's there's guys that are in the locker room that are loud. We have a guy on our team who's a fifth year senior, who you know, is is the perfect citizen, the perfect citizen. He's in grad school now. He got 4.0 last semester. Um, a really good player. Probably has a chance to start for us again. And. Um, but he's a, he's a quiet guy by nature. So leadership has to be authentic, you know? And, and so I, I think coach already talked about one of his sophomores having the opportunity to potentially lead and you don't need to wait, you know, to be a leader. Like if, if you're going to do it, then you need to be consistent about it. And if a sophomore on the team and we have a freshman point guard, who's got a really, really good chance to start for us. We need him to be a leader, you know? And, and so he can do it with his voice, he can do it with his actions, but he's got to do it consistent. You got to be the same guy every single day. If you're loud and you know, that's your, that's your personality, then be that, 
you know, embrace that. And so uh, I know that with Bryce leaving and, and things of that nature, they, they definitely have that void, you know, of, of kind of an upperclassman that maybe can take the reins. But if there's enough of them, you can do it by committee too. And I think that uh, the, the hurdles that they w went over last year and, and not having the season that they all wanted hopefully drives them all to, to kind of come together as a collective unit. And if there's a driving voice, great. If there's three or four, then great, you know, and, and uh, you know, obviously I'll be rooting for them no matter where they're at or where we're at. Well, we're going to be hoping we can see them in the Kaline, uh, watching them as well. And we're going to be tuning into uh, the VCU games as much as we can. Jimmy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. And we're excited to get this episode out to the entire Dickinson community. Yeah, appreciate you guys. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for coming on. No problem. Back again after another great interview. Uh, really appreciated uh, Coach Martelli coming on. Uh, but the Grazer has another word. Complex is something no coach or athlete wants to deal with, which is why every team aims to keep schemes and execution simple. Success is easy to achieve. That's the game plan used by the Grazer right here in Carlisle, or there in Carlisle. Uh, simple ingredients that are fresh, Healthy and above all delicious, healthy, not boring food that is not just good, but good for you. Made for you, uh, made from only the healthiest and simple ingredients. So come in today and enjoy a great meal made simple at the Grazery. Again, located at 156 West High Street in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Okay. As you have all been waiting this entire week, <laughs> it is time for Dom's weird story of the week. So we go west to Pittsburgh, PA, where 96-year-old Sarah Lyons of McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, who, as she said, later told KDKA TV that she had been bowling since age 27, and it took her to age 96 until she was finally able to bowl her first 300 score, which was also the first 300 bowled at the bowling alley that she has been bowling at. So it took her 69 years for her to bowl of bowling to bowl her first nice. 300. Um, hopefully I'm alive at 96 and let alone able to stand up. So bowling at 300 built different. Go ahead, Sarah. Good stuff. Living legend. That's nuts. I can't believe that. That's so, that's so crazy. We got to get her on the show. Yeah. I want to interview this lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll reach out to her. No, I mean, everyone looks forward to Dom's moment. I mean, even coach Martelli had to ask us uh, before we interviewed him since he wasn't going to be on for the moment, what it was. So yeah, man. <laughs> yeah that was that. So uh, yeah, let's move that's on to the next cool. one. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. All right. So, I mean, you know, I usually make a hot take about a game that's going on, but this week we're doing a little something different, especially because we haven't really given the love to the MLB that we maybe should have or could have. So I'll give you guys, uh, oh. as the season's wrapping up, uh, my pick for uh, both uh, MVPs and Cy Youngs uh, going on the MLB. So I'll go start with the Cy Youngs. Uh, first in the uh, AL, I'm going to roll with Shane Bieber. And I feel like that one's more or less a unanimous decision. Like this man's been completely dominant um, this Crazy. season. He's rocking a one seven four ERA. He's eight and one, and he's uh, been more or less unstoppable. And then moving over to the NL, this one's kind of a both because he has played well and a personal pick. I'm picking Trevor Bauer. He's 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 only sporting a four and four record, but he still has a one eight ERA, which is still incredible. He is a in an eight two WHIP, so he's really been. Uh, even possibly better than Shane Bieber uh, this season. And it really has been remarkable to watch. He just hasn't gotten the run support that he's deserved. Now, moving over to my MVPs, my pick in the AL is Jose Abreu. Uh, a little bit of a surprise this year, um, seeing him step up and, and, you know, an age 33 player, he stepped up, he's in 332 uh, with 19 homers, 56 RBIs. And he's been a, an incredible standout for a Washington, or sorry, not Washington, a White Sox team that's far exceeded what people probably expected them to do. They made some good moves in the off season and have made a lot of noise. And this one, you know, I could see this being Fernando Tatis, which everyone wants to vote for, but uh, my pick, and it's a personal pick is Freddie Freeman. I'm a big Freddie Freeman fan and uh, he's hitting almost 350 this year. He may only have 12 home runs, but he's got 50 RBIs, incredible OP, uh, OPS. And, 
you know, he is someone who I've always rooted for, always waited for him to have, you know, that one standout season. And although this one's been short, he's uh, really exceeded expectations and led a uh, pretty talented Atlanta lineup who just clinched. Yeah, I don't know about all the Freddie Freeman stuff there, Sam. I mean, I'm definitely taking either – I mean, I'm even taking either Tatis or Mookie Betts over, over Freddie Freeman right now. I mean, Can't take Mookie Betts after he left. Can't do it. Oh, well, yeah, I understand you, Red Sox fan and all that, but, like, he's having a fantastic year. I mean, Freddie Freeman definitely has flown under the radar, um, and he's just an absolute Philly killer, no question about it. So I, I have a lot of respect for him, and he's a good dude, and I love listening to those mic'd ups. Um, but I like your I like your uh, Cy Young picks. Uh, I would only change the NL NL one to uh, Jacob Degrom. And uh, that being said, I am going to give you my top five uh, MLB pitchers um, for the year. So I know the playoffs are coming up soon, and um, pitching is always incredibly important in the playoffs. Some of these guys might not make the playoffs, but all right, we'll see. We'll we'll see who's on the list. So at number one, I'm going to go Jacob DeGrom. He's just un unbelievable. He, as bad as the Mets are, he always gives them a chance to win. Uh, number two, I'm going to go Shane Bieber. I mean, he's probably been the best pitcher in the AL, like Sammy said. So there's not really too much to say about that. He's helped the Indians win a lot of games. Um, Dustin May, number three, the pitcher for the Dodgers, who's a, uh, a young guy. He's rookie this year, and he's just got fantastic hair. Uh, he's, and he looks like a, he's, a, he's a beast of a pitcher. I had never seen a ball move like that out of anybody's hand that young. Um, next on the list, we're going to go Trevor Bauer. I love Trevor Bauer. He's one of the, my favorite follows on Twitter also. He's just – he's so funny, and he's, he's just got this prowess on the mound that I've, that I've never seen before either. Um, he's telling batters what he's throwing before he even throws it and still gets them out. Like, it's the, it's the most – it's the funniest thing ever. And then I'm going to go with at number five, Aaron Nola. Just because I am, I am a little bit biased. Uh, he's not. He's. Uh, he didn't have a fantastic year, but at the same time, he still pitched really well. He's at a, I want to say like a three three ERA, and he never gets the run support ever. Just flat out. He threw his first complete game this year, and they lost. I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. Sam, Sam uh, Glavin always has to sneak in one Philly guy, and they're just not even close to being on the top five. That's not uh, you know that you know that's not true. Aaron Dude, Nola's Aaron is not a top five pitcher in the MLB. That's a little absurd. I don't know. Wentz isn't a top five quarterback in the NFL. Well, that's 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 up for grabs right now for sure, definitely. But I I that I will take Aaron Nola over a lot of people. He's top thirty. That's that's sure. you know that's you that's ridiculous and you know it, Dom. That's top thirty for sure. That's that's. Mm, mm. That's ridiculous. You can hear more about it on the Wolves of Broad Street podcast if you want. I'm a big Aaron Nola guy. Uh, the Wolves of Broad Street podcast will be coming back soon after a brief hiatus to uh, you know, get, get some of our stuff together. And uh, we're coming out with some new things. So there's my shameless plug for the, for the Wolves of Broad Street podcast. Uh, if we're self-plugging, by the time this podcast is released, I will have my interview out with <laughs> Christian Payne, who spent a lot of time – at Dickinson and actually was the president of RDSN. So tune into my podcast days with Dom. If you want to hear my interview with Christian, it's awesome getting to reconnect with him and hear from that. And with that being said, we hope you enjoyed today's episode and we're looking forward to releasing another one next week. So stay tuned. Thank you guys. Roll devs. Roll devs.